Good morning. Thank you for joining us. I am Francisco Guzman. I'm with the California Water Plan Program. I'll be managing today's webinar. As you can see on your screen, Paul, can you move to the next slide, please? As you can see on your screen, these are the webinar controls. As a quick audio check, if you can hear us, please raise your hand. Thank you. If you have questions, please enter, type them into the questions panel and we will answer them during the Q&A session. And with that, I'll turn it over to Abdul Khan. Abdul? Uh, thank you, Francisco. And good morning and welcome, everyone. I am Abdul Khan. I lead the water budget and analytics section in DWR's Division of Planning. As you may recall, a draft water budget handbook was released on February 7. Subsequently, we conducted a public webinar on March 12 and provided a summary of the water budget handbook contents. As part of ongoing conversations uh, on water budgets, we conducted a survey to seek additional feedback from our stakeholders to identify water budget components, which are either the most important or challenging to estimate from their perspectives. Based on feedback from that survey, we have designed today's webinar as an additional outreach event to continue that dialogue. Next slide, please. As you can see on this slide, uh, survey results show these four topics to emerge at the top. Stream groundwater interaction, groundwater extraction, change in groundwater storage, and evapotranspiration. DWR team members, uh, Todd Heller and Paul Shipman, Sakib Najmus from Udard and Curran Consultant, who assisted DWR in the Water Budget Handbook, and I will focus on these four topics in addition to providing an overview of the handbook. Next slide, please. Today's webinar is divided into several segments. First, I'll provide an overview of the handbook. Then Paul will cover evapotranspiration. Next, Todd will talk about groundwater extraction. Finally, Sakib will discuss stream groundwater interaction and change in groundwater storage. As you can see, we are not following the high to low results from the survey. Rather, we chose to maintain the sequence of contents in the handbook while still covering all the topics of high interest. After these presentations, Tyler Hatch from DWR's Sustainable Groundwater Management Office will discuss considerations in light of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. I'll close the webinar with a couple of additional observations. We would like this webinar to be as interactive as possible. So we have designed the webinar such that about half the time is used for presentations while remaining half for Q&A. We request you to ask any questions that you may have on each topic. We'll respond to your questions at the end of the presentation for each topic. We also have an optional 30-minute Q&A session at the end of the webinar to respond to the questions that we could not get to during the presentations. Please go to next slide and load the water budget story map. Thank you. We have released a water budget story map that provides an overview of the water budget handbook development. This story map sets the context and provides a venue for outreach and accessing information on the handbook and connecting with us. The water budget story map depicts a story of innovations in water accounting in California, led by DWR, in collaboration with many others. We recognize the many challenges in water management in the state and the need for an innovative tool like the Water Budget Handbook 
to address some of these challenges. Next page, please. As a state, we believe we can manage our water resources better by understanding and quantifying water budgets. A water budget for an area is important because it provides an understanding of historical conditions and how future changes to supply, demand, hydrology, population, land use, and climate may affect the water resources of the area. Water agencies use water budgets for a variety of purposes, such as water supply planning and evaluating the effectiveness of management actions to ensure long-term sustainability of surface water and groundwater resources. Recognizing the importance of water budgets, Several legislation, including the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and Assembly Bill 1668, have codified water budget development to be part of groundwater sustainability plans and agricultural water management plans, respectively. Recently released, Governor's Draft Water Resilience Portfolio has actions recommending the development of water budgets as an integral planning component to advance water resilience in California. Next page, please. Total water budget, shown on right side of the screen, represents a comprehensive accounting of all inflows to and outflows from the three interacting systems in an area. The land system is shown at the top of the screen, the surface water system in the middle, and the groundwater system at the bottom. Total water budget, a three-dimensional system representation of water budget components, is critical for managing water resources more effectively based on an understanding of system interactions and movement of water uh, between the three systems. Paul just loaded uh, the total water budget schematic on right side, of, right side of the screen, which provides a composite view of the three systems. Next page, please. A critical challenge to understanding total water budgets is use of inconsistent definitions for water budget components by water agencies and water practitioners. The same term is sometimes used to define different components, while different terms may be used to mean the same water budget component. The first ever common vocabulary for each component of the total water budget has been developed collaboratively with vetting from multiple DWR programs, the State Water Resources Control Board, US Geological Survey, and academia. The common vocabulary developed will facilitate consistent understanding and communication of water budgets among water practitioners. Next page, please. To address the various challenges identified, we offer a solution, the Water Budget Handbook, as a practical reference guide for the California water resources community for developing water budgets for any geographic area and time period using modeling and non-modeling approaches. The handbook systematically represents relevant water budget information in a single publication. It includes the concept of total water budget, common vocabulary, water budget accounting template, decision tree for selecting an approach, and guidance on documenting water budgets. Use of the handbook will facilitate consistent development and communication of water budget information by diverse water management entities. The handbook will reduce the cost of water budget development and documentation for local and regional agencies. Next page, please. The handbook includes a standardized water budget accounting template 
to address a major challenge of use of non-standard water accounting, which makes it difficult to understand and communicate water budget information. The water budget accounting template helps organize and present inflows and outflows for the land system, the surface water system, and the groundwater system, as well as the total water budget. These templates are shown on right side of the screen, starting with the land system on the left and ending with the total water budget on the right. It is difficult to see this clearly on the screen. However, you can find uh, the details on them in the handbook. This accounting template, we believe, will facilitate standardization, error checking, and correction of water budget estimates. Use of a standardized template will also result in improved communication and coordination with neighboring water agencies through consistent water budget accounting across boundaries. Next page, please. The handbook also includes the first ever compilation of relevant key data sources with tips and practical advice on how to use the sources to develop estimates of various water budget components. As displayed on right side of the screen, a companion, easy to use table shows the relevance of the data sources to each of the water budget components and an example application of the data resources directory shows its utility for estimating uh, water budget components. Next page, please. We believe water budget information should be presented with charts, maps, and summary tables to improve understanding and sharing of water budget components with agencies within a region as well as in neighboring regions. Like the common vocabulary and the water budget accounting template, communication can be significantly improved when water budget information is presented in an organized way with charts, maps, and tables. Examples of how these maps, charts, and tables may look like are shown on right side of the screen. These are actually the ones uh, we developed and used as part of the Tulare Lake and Central Coast Hydrologic Region water budget pilot projects, which were precursors of the water budget handbook. Next page, please. We must work together to build a more water resilient California. We believe that the contents included in the water budget handbook, common vocabulary, water budget accounting template, decision trees for choosing an approach, guidance for documenting water budgets, methods and examples, and data resources directory will enable water entities to build trust and work with each other more effectively and collaboratively to understand and address some of the major water challenges of California. Next page, please. The water budget handbook is currently out for public review. With the comment period closing on May 7, as shown on right side of the screen, and Paul is highlighting that, the date April 7 on shown on left side of the screen has been extended by a month because of the COVID-19 situation. We invite you to share your ideas with us to improve the water budget handbook on an ongoing basis. Thank you, everyone. And now I'd like to invite Paul to talk about evapotranspiration. Hello, everybody. As we saw from the survey, evapotranspiration is a subject of great interest in water budgets. And so this part of the presentation is going to talk about how we can use the handbook to help develop those estimates. So evapotranspiration is covered in section 3.4 of the handbook which starts on page 63. To provide some context for rep transpiration, it's a primarily land surface phenomenon through which water uh, leaves the land surface and goes to the atmosphere. 
An important part of a controlled vocabulary is identifying both what something is and what something isn't. So other elements not included in what we call rapid transpiration include conveyance evaporation, stream evaporation, and lake evaporation. If we go to the handbook itself, we'll look at a definition for rapid transpiration, which is the volume of water entering the atmosphere through the combined process of rapid transpiration from soil and plant surfaces and transpiration from plants. The handbook also includes additional context uh, of exactly what we, we consider included in rapid transpiration which is that ET is, a, is a, an outflow component from the land system within the water budget zone to the atmosphere. It includes the volume of water transpired by plants for growth, including both crops, native and repairing, repairing vegetation, landscape grasses, et cetera. It includes volume of water evaporated from marshlands and managed wetlands. It includes the volume of water evaporated from bare soil surface. And includes the volume of water evaporated from plant leaves during and after a precipitation event. An important thing to understand about ET is that the estimation is typically done with um, some consideration as to what type of land is in use. For example, in agricultural lands, ET is often equal to the crop water requirement because it's generally assumed that agricultural land is well watered. The amount of ET from precipitation supply and applied water is equal to what the crop needs to grow. This is not always true and you will have uh, situations in which you have deficit irrigation occurring but it is a general assumption that is sometimes helpful when developing evapotranspiration estimates. In urban settings, evapotranspiration is typically um, equal to the use of water by large land, large landscape, although there can be other sources of evapotranspiration in urban settings. In managed wetland settings, evapotranspiration includes both evaporation from the wetlands itself, as well as evapotranspiration of the plants uh, that are included as part of the wetland, managed wetlands. And finally, in native and riparian settings, the supply will include precipitation as well as potentially um, shallow groundwater in, in cases where that's available to the um, native vegetation, as well as you know, stream water in, for riparian vegetation. ET interacts with many other water budget components. As you can see, it's primarily made up of, or primarily sourced from applied water and precipitation. Those are kind of your input through water supply for your transpiration. But not all of applied water or precipitation goes to about transpiration. It actually goes to many other sources, other places, which can make estimation of about transpiration itself quite difficult. The handbook includes a few methods for estimating ET. I'm going to go through each method. Method one is to obtain ET information directly from reports or studies in the area. There are a lot of um, studies that have been done in California that do include estimations of ET. And if you're in an area that includes one of those studies, it makes sense to use what's been developed as those are typically vetted by locals already and they um, have been calibrated through other information. So one place you might find those is in existing agricultural water management plans. Many of those have ET information. Um, there's a few other resources that are available in the handbook that would help you find ET uh, information directly. However, oftentimes the study areas or the time frame won't match what you need in your water budget, in which case you won't be able to necessarily use that information. Method two is to obtain estimates from, from models. There are a few different types of models. First is remote, sense, remote sensing approaches to adaptive transpiration. These include using um, you know, satellites and such to measure reflectance from the Earth's surface and develop an, an actual ET amount estimation from, from that. Uh, what's important about remote sensing is that you're, you're attempting to develop the actual ET used by the crop um, after all the other uh, effects like, say, soil types and um, depth irrigation. So, if you use actual ET, you don't have to worry about those issues. The interesting thing about remote sense approaches is they are still an emerging technique, and while resolution or while accuracy is improving, um, generally ET estimation is um, considered to be have an error band of around 20% or more. Um, the handbook documents a few different versions of Sensing, most sensing approaches, but there are many more than just this. 
Uh, so one few in the handbook include metric, CBOL, SSCBOP, and SIMS. There are other approaches to uh, estimating remote, uh, sorry, estimating ET, not including remote sensing. They rely on more traditional uh, techniques and uh, empirical formulas, such as Hargrave Samani, Priestley Taylor, or um, Um, a few of those models that exist that are available for use include the CalSimata, California Simulation of uh, Evaporative Transpiration of Applied Water, developed by DWR and UC Davis, um, and you know, C2V Sim are a few of them. There are many other empirical models. And additionally, there are also spreadsheet models that develop um, develop transpiration more empirically. Um, one example of that is the California Water Plan Water Portfolios. More sources can be found in Section 9. In fact, rapid transpiration has one of the most um, number of resources available for it. Although it's important to note that the resource won't necessarily get you to rapid transportation itself, but it may get you to an element that's important for ET. For example, um, 9.8 highlighted here, the California Pesticide Information Portal, has information that's very helpful in determining um, the land use in the area, which is a big component oftentimes of developing uh, ET estimation. So method three is to use a crop coefficient method. So you may not be that you don't want to use one of those uh, models that already exists or that you can't for some reason. So in which case you could use um, a you know, crop coefficient method. Crop coefficient works by um, calculating crop ET as uh, equal to the crop acres times the ETC. Uh, ETC is equal to the crop coefficient KC times the reference ET or ETO. Uh, to use this method, what you want to do is collect your crop acreage data from one of those sources we've highlighted already or directly from locals. Um, obtain your ETC value or your most likely your KC and ETO values. ETO uh, in the California is available from um, CIMIS. CIMIS presents reference ET uh, throughout the whole state via spatial CIMIS, which is very valuable. But there are uh, other ways to develop FF transpiration as well. Um, and KCs are developed through uh, you know, studies, and a lot of literature has documented KCs over time. Although our understanding of KCs is always um, continuing to improve, and there are ongoing efforts right now, for example, through UC Davis and University of um, and DWR to improve that through the Three Cs Cooperative Group. There's examples in the handbook as well as of how to develop um, ET using the crop coefficient method. In this example, um, we use the a grape grower, for example, would use this reference ET from zone three, which can be found as 0.18 inches per day or 5.58 inches per month. They use a KC from FAO 56. That's a um, paper on crop coefficients released by uh, United Nations. Um, so that calculation is shown here. And then if you have the ETC, you can then multiply by the crop acreage and convert to from inches to feet to get a total crop ET. Method four is to use a water duty-based approach. Um, one important part about this approach is that you're not um, using measured data, but rather you're using uh, an approximation of the amount of water used based on experience from farmers. So again, you're going to develop your, or you know, some other people also doesn't have to be farmers, but other experts in the area. You're going to develop your crop acreage data. You're going to collect crop irrigation efficiency data. This is an important step here. And then you'll, to do is you have to calculate your ET of applied water by multiplying your crop water duty, typically expressed as a, you know, two acre feet per acre or something like that, by your crop acreage and your irrigation efficiency, which will give you ET of applied water. If you're using this method, you would need to develop your ET of precipitation separately, likely through um, you know, a soil water balance model or a um, rainfall runoff model. And now we're opened up for questions related to evapotranspiration and the estimation thereof. Thank you, Paul. We do have a question. So the question is, is there a standard conver conversion table 
to use for converting CFS or flow to acre feet or gallons. It seems that different agencies have used different conversion formulas in the past. Um, I don't have a really great response to that. I'm sorry. I assume you would just look up the conversion factor. It's interesting to hear that there's been different conversion factors used. Okay, so we'll go to the next question then. How is evaporation, evapotranspiration computed for flowing water such as in aqueducts, rivers, and streams? So about transpiration and flowing waters like aqueducts, rivers, and streams, there's a few different things there. Rivers and streams would be estimated via um, stream evaporation, which is a different section of the handbook. Let me look it up real quick. Um, we have information for that in the handbook as well. And that is in, one second, please. Um, stream evaporation is in, is in section 4.4. 4. Which occurs on page um, 141 of the, 144 of the handbook, and then um, if you're looking for aqueducts, I, mean, I guess that would also be, um, you know, stream evaporation or conveyance evaporation is the other option there, which could be found um, also in the handbook. Uh, conveyance evaporation 4.5. It's a section right after that, it's like page 150. We didn't go into great detail on those topics in this webinar as those weren't tied as being high interest topics. But if they are high interest topics, we'd be happy to go into them in greater detail in a future webinar. Thank you, Paul. We have another question. In C2V SIM, there's one term, agricultural supply requirement. What is the difference between agricultural supply requirement and applied water? Does the agricultural supply requirement include or be satisfied by direct precipitation? I will defer to a few of our experts on CTB SIM on the line. Um, I don't know if Abdul, uh, you, Saqib. Uh, Go ahead. This is Saqib Paul. Let me see whether I can understand. Uh, Francisco, could you repeat the question? Yes. In C2V SIM, there is one term, agricultural supply requirement. What is the difference between the agricultural supply requirement and applied water? Does the agricultural supply requirement include or be satisfied by direct precipitation? Uh, yeah, I think uh, this probably is defined in the IWFM manual, but uh, it is. Agricultural supply requirement is based on the crop ET need. And then part of that supply requirement is met by the precipitation. And then the rest of it is met by the applied water, which constitutes like the groundwater pumping and the surface water delivery. So it, yes, it does include uh, you know precipitate you know, any part that is met by precipitation. So in our context, it would be um, equal to the total requirement of the crop. Right, crop water requirement. Yeah. So we have another question. Of all the ET methods presented. You mentioned that ET actual by remote sensing has errors of about 20%. What are the anticipated errors and the methods presented? Sorry, I should have clarified. ET in general has a has a error has uncertainty of around 20%. Uh, that is kind of a lower band. It can also be quite a bit higher than that. Um, there are have been several studies attempting to um, compare various remote sensed ETs in the same locations, and there is quite significant variance between the different techniques. 
Uh, in fact, NASA is currently um, engaging in a program called Open ET, um, which is really exciting because it's going to compare a lot of different freely available remote sense ET methods um, in large areas for an extended period of time. And the hope is that through that process, uh, those models will be able to um, improve and hopefully come, you know, bring their numbers closer together to reduce that uncertainty. Uh, generally, to get an actual accurate, uh, an accurate quote within like 5% error um, of estimation of evapotranspiration, you would need uh, an incredibly specialized um, measurement tool as well as somebody who's well, who, who's very good at measuring it. Um, so even those the empirical models are also, you know, generally in the range of uncertainty of 20%. Assuming they're being used correctly also. Obviously, if they're being used incorrectly, that will significantly increase your uncertainty. Um, real quick, a few of the things that contribute to uncertainty of remote sensing specifically uh, include how clouds are masked, as clouds will significantly limit the ability to measure reflectance and other things that are measured off the fan surface. Um, just the number of clouds that exist in the area, um, as well as for some techniques, um, there's some manual interpretation of hot and cold pixels and other things that will can significantly vary the uncertainty. Thank you, Paul. We have time for one more question, and it is, how often are vegetation maps updated for crop coefficients? Are there remote sensing options? And if yes, what are the products? Are there, there's a few different questions there, sorry. How often are vegetation maps updated for crop coefficients? Um, I don't know the answer to that, uh, but we could possibly get you the answer back later. Um, I do know that is that that is watched very closely by DWR's uh, land and water use section, who are intimately involved in that work. Um, there was other parts of that, Francisco. Can you say that again? Yes. So, are there remote sensing options? And if yes, what are the products? Um, so a variety of remote sensing products that are freely available are documented in the handbook in section um, section 3.4, uh, starting on page uh, 66, if you want to look at that. And then in section 9, we could provide links to those products where you can look at them. Uh, DWR did not develop their own remote sensing information, but um, there are many different products out there already that are documented in the handbook. All right, thank you, Paul. We can move forward to the next session section. Thanks. I'll turn it over to Todd. Todd, are you there? Yes, good morning, everyone. I'm going to talk today about groundwater extraction. Next slide. So section 3.7 in the handbook focuses on groundwater section. As you can see, I have the table of contents highlighted, and I'm also showing the total water budget schematic on the right side, just for clarity of the components we're talking about here. So the red arrow points to groundwater extraction. If you've looked at the total water budget schematic, there's several terms uh, uh, included in when you look at groundwater extraction uh, as all the components. Right next to it, there's stored water extraction. You can see the arrow there. And on the lower right side, in the orange arrows, you see groundwater export and stored water export. We cover a variety of groundwater extraction terms to make the total water budget very comprehensive. And some of the 
the methods to calculate these will be similar, but I'm really going to focus today really only on groundwater extraction. Next slide. So in section 3.7, you're going to find a typical page that kind of outlines what you're going to find and the information we're going to give you. In each section, we give you a definition. In this case, groundwater extraction is defined as the volume of groundwater pumped extracted from the underlying aquifers for use within the water budget zone. It does not include groundwater export, stored water extraction, and stored water export. We also highlight some things that you can uh, also consider. And when you're things to consider, and I've put in the land system water but land system schematics so that uh, you can see kind of what we're talking about. When we think of groundwater extraction, groundwater extraction is uh, helping to meet a supply requirement within the managed land use system. And I've highlighted there the arrow in yellow and applied water. So groundwater extraction along with surface water goes to meet applied water. And so I will be kind of elaborating on both groundwater extraction and, and applied water to help pro provide uh, some tools to help uh, estimate groundwater. So going back over to the right side, some things to consider. You know, Paul had mentioned in his presentation, when you think about groundwater extraction, you might need to think about adjustments for deficit irrigation. We provide you a reference back to evapotranspiration to help um, uh, guide you in, in considering these, these types of things. We also include adjustments for irrigation efficiency, and that's mentioned in section 3.5.1, and I'll go into that a little bit more in a bit. We give some context to what, what uh, calculating groundwater extraction would be. Next slide. And here I'm gonna highlight some things that we provide context about so that you can calculate or get values that best represents what's going on in your area. There's some things that you need to look at in terms of identifying if lands are fully or partially irrigated with groundwater. Um, there's a difficulty when groundwater and surface water uses occur on the same field. Uh, uh, local knowledge can also help assist in approximating reasonable estimates, reaching out to your farm, farm advisors, water districts, so forth. Um, also, irrigation with groundwater often makes use of drip and sprinkler technology, resulting in higher irrigation efficiencies and lower applied water use in surface water. So there may be a need you wanna kind of break this out and better represent your groundwater extraction values. Also, there is kind of a default way to look at this in terms of uh, estimating groundwater subtraction by subtracting surface water deliveries and applied water reuse from total applied water to get your, your groundwater extraction. Next slide. So now I'm gonna go into the methods within the handbook. Here I'm gonna highlight two of the methods for calculating groundwater or to getting groundwater extraction values. Method one is to obtain measured groundwater extraction data. This is the best of all circumstances. If you have measured data, most definitely use it. But we realize that there's a lot of shortcomings. We don't have a lot of data. And so here we provide a few available sources. Uh, commonly local agencies will have municipal, industrial, maybe some large landscape, and maybe a little bit of agricultural groundwater extraction data. Uh, you can attain the data from them. Uh, the municipal data, there's online reporting for the State Water Resources Control Board. You can obtain that data. So these are ideal. In the fe near future, we hope that with uh, SIGMA, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, uh, GSAs, Groundwater Sus Sustainability Agencies, will re be reporting groundwater extraction estimates on an annual basis. 
Method two uses published reports and numerical methods. Sometimes people have already done analysis that you can benefit from and go look at these resources to look at what they've estimated from their reports and studies. You can go take a look at uh, existing groundwater models such as the CVHM, which is the Central Valley Hydrologic Model, or the C2VSIM model, this is California Central Valley Simulation Model, or you may have a local model. Those could be resources to help hone in on what you think your groundwater estimates are in your area. Also, the California Water Plan has data. So there's some potential data sources to go look at, and we kind of highlight those in our data resources directory. Next slide, please. So in the data resources directory, what you will find, we have this matrix table to help uh, locate information and that is available. So what you see across the top are the water budget components, and down the left side, you'll see the title of resources of available. These will be different data resources and they all have a number assigned to them. As you can see, I have highlighted in orange groundwater extraction column. And then you can see the dots where data are available. And so in the blue boxes, I've highlighted what if we're looking for groundwater extraction data, hmm, maybe we can look at the CalSIM 2 model or the C2 VSIM course grid model or the DWR ag land and water use estimates. And those are all potential sources. They have data pages that you can go find out more information in the data resources directory. Next slide. Moving on to method three, this kind of gets into more of the calculations for estimating extraction volumes, and we're going to provide some information to help guide you. So, you know, with the yellow arrow, you look at the larger page on the right side, and that gives you some kind of some guidance and thoughts and approaches to how to calculate groundwater extraction. One of the things that can be very helpful and we've identified, if you know something about water source mapping, and that's that blue arrow, and I kind of draw you out to the blue area shaded on the left side of the screen. If you and your water, if you have a water budget zone and you ha can map out roughly the areas that are using surface water, groundwater, and maybe a mixed source water or applied water yield, reuse, if you can map those out and combine them with land use data that represents your crops, you would be able to identify which crops are grown with which water source type, which will help you uh, more directly improve your calculations of groundwater extraction. And you can see the arrow uh, of applied groundwater. You can try to calculate it a little bit more directly. But if you don't have that information or you're uncertain about that, you can still calculate groundwater as more of an uh, applied water balance, as you can see in the equation at the bottom. Groundwater extraction is equal to applied water minus surface water deliveries minus reuse. Next, pay, next slide. So I'm gonna go a little bit into applied water because that becomes the basis of helping to uh, calculate your groundwater extraction. Here on the left side, there's the schematic for agricultural applied water, and you can kind of see how the components interact in a visual way. On the right side, here's some bar charts. You kind of seen these before, Paul presented them in, in, in looking at ET. Here on the right side, bar chart, you see this kind of supply side, applied water. You can see the different water supplies that make up applied water. On the left side bar chart under applied water, you can see the disposition of applied water, whether it's ET, recharge, return flow, and reuses. So these are the components. Why do we need to know this? Because this is helps us understand when we look at efficiency, 
irrigation efficiency, water is going to go into these different dispositions so that you can think about it and help define your irrigation efficiencies, which will define the amount of applied water that you'll calculate. Next slide. So going out to back to section 3.5.1, this presents ag applied water steps, and we can use it to calculate groundwater extraction. I've highlighted the, the method, and then taking a look at, let's say the crop T ET approach highlighted in yellow, we can follow the arrow over and we're provided with some steps to go back through and calculate, uh, you know, the various components that build their way up to calculating applied water. You can see at the bottom of the page, the steps after st step six, we get an equation of applied water is equal to ETAW, evapotranspiration of applied water divided by irrigation efficiency plus cultural practices. A basic equation kind of showing you the things you need to consider. Following the arrow, continue the steps, you can get to step seven, calculating the volume of groundwater extraction based on that equation. Next slide. So we give you kind of an example of showing maybe this land use and water source mapping to estimate groundwater extraction. Again, kind of building on what I had talked previously about. Here we've taken land use data from DWR. This could be a statewide coverage or a coverage for your local a county coverage. And then where we've estimated areas that are using surface, water, groundwater, mixed water source, we're able to do GIS queries to come up with this, this example in table 3-1. You see columns of information. We are able to put our crop, we're able to define maybe whether fields are fully or partially irrigated, which is important because that drives the amount of ET. Uh, we did a data query on lands using surface water, a data query on lands using groundwater, and a data query on surface and groundwater mixed use. We applied a mixed source split, kind of trying to assign the mixed source back to surface and groundwater categories so that we can come up with total lands using surface water and total lands using groundwater by crop to make our calculations. Next slide. We also need to know something about irrigation efficiencies and sometimes we have good information, sometimes we don't. But here's just kind of a guide and information as a starting place. A couple tables that define potential magnitude of irrigation losses, one for furrow, one for sprinkler. I'm gonna focus on table 3-4, where we can look at a type of irrigation system. In this case is every row for furrow irrigation. You can look at distribution system losses. It was relatively low based on the studies that uh, went into these tables, but you could also look at the recharge component of irrigation efficiency could be 10 to 20%, surface runoff could be 10 to 35%. You can help refine that based on looking at maybe soils data for your area. And then you can look that way that you can come up with an overall irrigation efficiency that uh, you would use for your applied water calculations. Next slide. Now looking at an applied groundwater example, using the equation highlighted in the, the box where we're gonna basically sum up acreage times unit ETAW divided by irrigation efficiency and cultural practices by crop, we could hone in on a groundwater extraction value. With this, we provide in table 3.3-3 kind of an example. Uh, we're building on this example that I started uh, showing you a few minutes ago. And this shows where we have our crops, our area, our acreage. We came up with an ETAW. We developed an irrigation efficiency for each of the crops, looked at cultural practices and came up with applied water, where then if you sum everything together in the green, you come up with a total apply, 
total groundwater applied water, which becomes your groundwater extraction. Next slide. You know, also in a similar fashion, you can look at urban applied water in section 3.5.2. The schematic on the left kind of shows the things to consider for urban applied water. It covers both landscape and indoor ir landscape irrigation and indoor water use. So when we translate that to the bar charts that you've seen before, you go, okay, well, we have our supply side of applied water, and then we have the applied water, the dispositions of it. There we got to now think about return flow from indoor water use, return flow from outdoor water use, recharge, things that make up the components of applied water and, and thinking through that when you make these calculations. Next slide. So we're gonna use method three here, and I'm just gonna highlight a few things to consider when you're working through urban, urban data, because sometimes urban data is measured and sometimes it's not, or the numbers, we have, there's issues, or you have a lot of rural areas, so forth. So you can use these techniques to kind of make those estimates. So things to look at populations for your cities or water purveyors, you can look at per capita water uses and maybe use a per capita water use from another area if you don't have that available. Uh, you can look at industrial water use. Uh, that should be included in there. And then landscapes like golf courses and parks you need to consider those, especially where if you have an area where there's a lot of them. Next slide. So just kind of giving you would give some examples in the handbook. This is just kind of an excerpt to show one example. This is for an area in northeastern California is a very simple example of applying, you know, the summation of population times per capita water use by service area and building your urban data. In this case, we had a population of a town called Alturas. We had a per capita water use that they, because they had measured data, we have that. We had a rural area that had a population and all that's groundwater. And for those areas, we selected a, a, a municipality that had a representative per capita water use that showed a lot more outdoor irrigation with the higher per capita water use. We take all that data and are able to estimate a groundwater extraction value. So next slide. So altogether, I've kind of given you some, a few examples, some thoughts and approaches, and that's, that's what's contained in the handbook to help guide you in uh, making some estimates of groundwater extraction or going to look for data that could apply to your area, kind of going through all three methods within uh, section 3.7. Next slide. Uh, do you have any questions? Thank you, Todd. We do have a question. How would you account for groundwater pumping in a subbasin that is applied in an adjacent subbasin? So I think if I heard the question right, it was groundwater pumping in your basin right. could you repeat that one once more make sure i'm understanding that question yes. how would you account for groundwater pumping in a sub basin that is applied in an adjacent sub basin okay um that's that would actually fall under a, it depends. If it's under, it would be groundwater export to another basin, or if it's under a formal program like a bank recharge, you want, would want to account for that as stored, stored water export. Now, if, you, that, if that data, if that, those groundwater extraction was not measured, let's just say hypothetically, then the, the things that I presented here, you could use to make those estimates. So, um, so 
in that other basin, if you knew so much acreage is being irrigated, um, the particular crop, particular irrigation method, you could actually do an applied water calculation for that area and say, okay, that's the amount of water that would need to be come from my sub basin to supply that area. Now, the only other thing you'd have to consider in there if there was any conveyance losses to get it there, and you could look at uh, other information in the handbook to help guide you in making that calculation. Thank you, Todd. We have another question. As slide mentioned, groundwater extraction is to subtract surface water delivery and applied water reuse from total applied water. Does it need to subtract precipitation? Uh, good question. No, you wouldn't. So let me clarify that when we're looking at ground or applied water, when we do applied water calculation it is based on, I mentioned ETAW divided by irrigation efficiency. And so ETAW is ET, ET of applied water. And we generate that information from a soil moisture balance. And when you do a soil moisture balance, you're addressing ET, you're addressing um, precipitation, and then ETAW is the amount of water that you have to supply to fully meet ET that is not met by precipitation. So that means precipitation has already been dealt with, and now you're dealing with just the uh, surface groundwater reuse requirement the water needed from those sources to meet the uh, to to meet the ET beyond precipitation. Yeah, I think uh, this is Sakib. I want to add, I think this is some clarification is connected to the egg supply requirement question that also came before that is in the CTV sim. So I'm actually going to read from the page 211 of the IWFM demand calculator documentation, which says agricultural supply requirement is basically uh, the requirement that is met by pumping and surface water delivery. That basically has already been accounted for the and is any consumptive is met by precipitation. So the documentation says you know there are two ways that uh, c2b sim handles egg supply requirement either you can provide the data if you know what is the egg supply requirement that will be met otherwise it will be calculated as uh, basically total amount of applied water needed to increase the soil moisture to irrigation target moisture plus the net return flow so there is, you know, I mean, this is not a simple concept. So documentation is the best source to look at all the definitions and related terms and understand when some component like consumptive meter precipitation is included uh, or not. So I just thought provide a clarification on the question that was related here. So Sakib, would you then say, this is Abdul, would you then say then uh, actually a supply requirement is equivalent to applied water? Uh, it should be. And theoretically, yeah. if you don't have a deficit irrigation, it should be basically that you are meeting with the surface water delivery, which you know, and sometimes if the pumping is not known, you basically you know, use that amount as the estimated pumping to meet the requirement. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We have another question. How are you accounting for pumpage from multi aquifer wells in this accounting? Yeah, good question. In this process, the way we're accounting for it, if you were 
estimating it from, let's say, the method three, you're more or less estimating groundwater extraction kind of irrelevant of the exact depths. So you, you're you calculating it based on a demand on the surface and whether you know it was a shallow, shallow groundwater or deep groundwater or groundwater wells from different uh, levels. Now, that gives you a value, a groundwater extraction value. Now, it can be difficult to tie that back to, I really want to know how much water is pumped from these different aquifers. You might, if, you're, if you had information, let's say, in GIS where you could, let's say, hypothetically, I have two aquifers in my uh, water budget zone and I can actually do query uh, my acreage and maybe my water source information by sub-basin, then you can break out groundwater extraction from each each basin. And I find it really helpful to make use a lot of GIS of making this analysis and kind of compiling crop acreage data to make those 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 types of estimates. Uh, if you don't have a lot of GIS data, you know that might be some limitations of how well you could maybe understand how much water is from each each sub basin. So hopefully that gives you at least a few ideas on on maybe how to how to approach that. Thank you, Todd. Uh, we have another question. You said that groundwater extraction is often calculated based on applied water minus surface water. Does this affect my water budget? Yes, it, it, it can to, to varying degrees. It kind of depends on the basin and the water management that's going on. Oftentimes, applied water, my surface water is um, very much represents or maybe a simplified approach. One of the drawbacks to that, when you calculate overall applied water just for all your acreage, all your crops, all as a mix. I mentioned earlier that sometimes surface water irrigation efficiencies and groundwater irrigation efficiencies differ just because of the nature of the supply and maybe how they're managed. There's different different crops. And if you're able to fine tune your irrigation efficiencies on those crops, especially using groundwater, and their irrigation efficiencies are higher, you can end up with a groundwater extraction, calculating groundwater extraction values that would be lower than uh, just using a generic irrigation efficiency for everything and uh, when you calculate just an overall groundwater applied number. So it all depends on water management, irrigation methods in your area uh, and you know the data available and how 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 you could approach calculating this but there is an advantage if you can break information out you could maybe come up with uh, groundwater extractions calculations or values that are more representative of what's going on versus more of a kind of a overall just a, a default from the applied water minus surface water result. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you, Todd. We have additional questions, but uh, our time is running short, so we will need to move to the next se section, but we will answer those questions afterwards. Good morning, everybody. This is Saqib. So next, I'm going to talk about the stream groundwater interaction. Next slide, please. 
So as you can see in the handbook for water budget development, stream aquifer interaction is covered in section 5.4, which is page 192. Next slide, please. So in the context of our system-based three-dimensional water budget framework diagram, topic that I'm going to cover today is on the right-hand side, you can see the stream system and the groundwater system. There is an arrow going up and down for groundwater loss to stream and groundwater gain from streams. So I just want to put the context here. Next slide. So stream plays an important role in the total water budget. So stream groundwater interaction definitionally is that groundwater gain from stream is defined in the volume of water entering the groundwater system from rivers and stream. So either a stream could lose water to groundwater or could gain water from groundwater. If you look at the right-hand side picture, which basically shows all the components of stream flow, and if you can go to the next slide, I think we have a zoomed version of this figure. It shows basically all the components of stream flow, like for example, stream surface water inflow coming into the stream and then direct runoff and return flow coming into the stream, inflow from canals and other tributary streams are also coming to a stream reach. Then you have go out, go outgoings are surface water evaporation from the stream diversion and bypass flow from the stream. And then another component you can see at the bottom of the figure is the groundwater gain or loss, because this could be an inflow or an outflow depending on the connection between the stream and the groundwater. Next slide, please. So I want to kind of establish some of the cases for stream groundwater gain and loss. So, if the stream stage is lower than the surrounding groundwater levels, that is meaning the stream stage is higher than the groundwater, I'm sorry, the stream stage is lower than the surrounding groundwater levels, the groundwater system will lose water to the stream, depending on the position of the stream. So if you go to the next slide, please. This is this basically is the case one, showing that groundwater is above the stream stage. So groundwater is, you know, losing, water to the stream, that means stream is gaining. And case two is the reverse of it. If the stream flow is higher, the stream stage is higher than groundwater. So if you go to case two, there are two cases in this case. Next slide. So this is a losing and connected stream. That means stream stage is higher than groundwater. So stream is losing to the groundwater system. That's a case 2.1. And there could be another one called Next slide, losing and disconnected stream. When the groundwater level falls below the stream band, the formulation, the formula is a little different, it's still a losing, but the connection is disconnected. So that's why it's a different case. And we have given you in the handbook different formulas for calculating uh, these interaction. Next slide, please. In the handbook, we talk about six methods for calculating stream groundwater interaction. Next slide, please. So method one basically talks about use available studies and numerical models, which is our standard approach in this handbook, where you talk about method one is always look at existing documentation that you may have. And there are many studies that are available. Some of the studies are listed on the uh, method one for you to see where you can find information about this thing. Method two, next slide, please. So I want to show you some of the data sources that can be found in section nine. Uh, if you look at the section nine, which is page 340 to 343, if you look at this diagram, the table, which is in the handbook, you'll see that stream governor interaction on the top right corner is basically coming from multiple sources like CBHM, CTVSIM course grid model, and CTVSIM fine grid model. So you can look at those numerical models and find stream down interaction estimates that are being done by the model. Next slide, please. The method two uses a mass balance approach. So as I showed you before on the figure on the right-hand side, if you know all the components of stream flow, 
then you can use this formula that is shown by following a stepwise method. Like for example, we said delineate stream reaches, identify locations of inflow and outflow, estimate stream inflows. You may have some gauge data there, or you may be able to estimate that based on some watershed model. And if you have good data on diversions, estimation of runoff and return flow, which are discussed in section 3.10 in the handbook and return flow is section 3.11. So you can do all these estimation of stream evaporation under section 4.4. So if you can calculate all the components by some kind of methods, you could use this uh, mass balance equation to find about the downwater gain and loss. And also if you have gauge data, that will be very helpful for you using the mass balance approach. Next slide, please. Method three talks about using Darcy's law. For example, if you have a groundwater loss to stream, then next slide, next click, please. I should be. So if this is a situation that groundwater is above the stream stage, so it's losing to the stream, then the equation on the right hand side on the top equation that basically gives you the formula for calculating using a conductivity of the stream bed and area of water perimeter and then the you know gradient of the aquifer and the stream stages next slide please and if it is the reverse case that you have a stream stage which is higher than groundwater then the formula at the bottom of the right hand side page on the handbook page 196 and 197 you'll find those formulas to calculate the stream flow next slide please Method four talks about using a flow net analysis, and it is discussed in the handbook about using some, you know, kind of flow net. If you have good data, and you can calculate on the stream tube and uh, calculation, there's a formula also given to you on page 198 and 199 to how to calculate using a flow net analysis. Method five, next slide. Method five is a very simple method. It uses a constant seepage percentage method of a losing stream. For example, if you know that the stream is losing, you can calculate that it's 5% or 10% loss. This is used uh, widely in a canal situation. And then we also talk about in the handbook, page 199 and 200, and uh, method six, who is basically explains to you how do you separate base flow from the hydrograph and comparing from different locations, the base flow separation, you can calculate the stream gain and loss within a reach by using this separation method that are discussed in you know, different books. And Purdue University, if you look at the second paragraph on the bottom on the left-hand page, page 199, Purdue University maintains a similar program, web-based hydrograph analysis tool that you can utilize use your stream flow to do a similar hydrograph analysis. Next slide, please. So I think that's about the stream downwater interaction. Any questions on that? Thank you, Sakib. We do have a question. How do you determine whether stream gain contributed by underground return flow or native alluvial groundwater or both? Can we read the question again, Francisco? How do you, do you determine whether stream gains contributed by underground return flow or native alluvial groundwater or both? I think the estimation is based on uh, the source, you know, is difficult to estimate because it will be coming from any sources. So I think we look at the stream reach and do the mass balance or do some hydrograph calculation to understand how much water is coming to the stream or going out of the stream. And understanding the source of the base flow or the, uh, you know, the underground uh, return flow is uh, difficult unless you have a very good model or you have good data. We have another question. Of the methods you have presented, which do you find to be most accurate? 
uh, obviously, if you have gauge data between two stream breaches, then you would be getting the best estimation of the stream uh, gain or loss if you have all the data from the mass balance that you can estimate. But otherwise, we have found the most widely used method in the Darcy's flow equation that is being used because we have good data on the stream stage in many places. And also, we could have good monitoring data from groundwater levels. So you can use this Darcy's equation to estimate the stream for air action. Thank you, Sakib. We have another question. Mm -hmm. How do you estimate mountain from recharge via streams? Mountain recharge. Are you talking about the mountain? Yeah. Um, I think I need to get back to you on that one because there are watershed models you could do on the upstream. Uh, you know, you could do like, for example, upstream watershed modeling uh, to estimate how much runoff is happening on the mountain watershed and coming to the stream, or what is the groundwater interaction within that stream using some kind of recession formula. And some of that is used in the mountain watershed recharge calculation in IWFM. There are methods to calculate mountain watersheds. So I would recommend looking at the IWFM handbook for that. Thank you. How is diversion calculated for the 4A stream breach? Diversions are uh, two ways. One is a uh, lot of time it is measured data because people keep track of their diversions or otherwise it is uh, basically estimated as uh, Todd has mentioned to you depending on your land use and the agriculture supply requirement, uh, you basically can estimate back how much diversions uh, you might be getting. So it is uh, typically measured, but otherwise it could be estimated if you know what is the supply source for an agricultural land. And then if I can add to that, we also have a separate section on super squad diversion, which is section 4.3 that occurs on page 140. They'll have additional resources on super squad diversion. Thank you, Paul. We have another question. What type of monitoring system will you need to set up to estimate and determine surface water, groundwater interactions? Monitoring wise, you basically need to establish more uh, stream gauges in uh, estimating the more gauges you have, the better data you have and the density. And uh, based on that, actually in the past, USGS has published a report, I think in 1985 or so for Central Valley, estimating the stream recharge or stream aqua interaction in the Central Valley streams from 1961 to 1977 based on the stream gauge data. So it's, it's depend on the density of the stream gauging. Thank you. Is C2V SIM sources, are the C2V SIM sources of data, you mentioned actual surface groundwater interaction data, or is it a model production, uh, model output, sorry? That's a model output. Was F SFD being estimated via Zephyr, Jenkins, Euler, Hunt, or other analytical approaches? I'm sorry, read the question again, please. Was SFD being estimated via Zephyr, Jenkins, Euler, Hunt, or other analytical approaches? I don't have an answer for that question. I think I need to get back to you on that one. Uh, 
Okay, we have another question. Has there been a study done to characterize stream groundwater interaction for a large stream segment in California? As I mentioned before, there has been some study done by USGS that is published a while ago for the, I believe about almost 50 to 60 stream reaches in the Central Valley, giving the gain and loss of different reaches based on stream gauging data. But, uh, you know, there are not that I know of any other large uh, study for stream aquifer interaction. Is stream gauging one of the most accurate methods, yet more limited? Can DWR help GSAs be, can DWR help GSAs in recommending how many and where they need new stream gauges? I think that's the question I would defer to some DWR, uh, you know, person that's on the panel. Uh, the Tyler, Tyler, uh, uh, can you just, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. So, uh, so DWR has through the uh, Sustainable Groundwater Management Office has uh, the technical uh, assistance program and the technical support services, and so uh, stream gauges and other things may be something that can be uh, provided as part of that. Um, but I'm not sure if if we would go to the extent of being able to offer specific guidelines for the number of gauges and where they need to be located because that will largely depend on the location and the situation. So it's not going to be a one size fits all type of a thing. Uh, so it would largely depend. I wanted to add to that, there are a variety of other efforts that are, are um, in developing stream gauge networks and recommendations um, motivated both by legislation and by um, you know other entities' interest in the topic, but that wouldn't necessarily give you the stream gauge you would need to do this kind of analysis. Also, I think I want to add that there is an emerging field of uh, stream aquifer interaction using remote sensing temperature data from the hyperic zone of the steam, stream aquifer interaction. So this is an emerging field. We need to see how that is going to be, you know, uh, become uh, useful to us. Thank you, Sahib. I did not see any more questions, so we could move forward to the next section. Okay, so next I'm going to talk about estimating change in groundwater storage. Next slide, please. So in our handbook, section 510 discusses change in groundwater storage, which is page 213. Next slide, please. So again, put in the context, if you look at the diagram on the left at the very bottom part, Change in groundwater storage is the component we're going to talk about in this uh, presentation. Next slide, please. So I want to kind of establish on the context of change in groundwater storage and its relationship with overdraft. Simple definition that you can see on the left page says net change in the volume of groundwater stored within the underlying aquifer within the water budget zone that you're looking at. So there is a change in groundwater storage. And if you look at the general equation that we have, basically it's an inflow to aquifer minus outflow from aquifer. So when you calculate, there are different methods of calculating that. And depending on your methods that you use, and also you could estimate change in groundwater storage from some measured data using groundwater level data. So you can look at the equation at the bottom of the page on the left side which talks about mass balance error. Like if you know the inflow to aquifer and outflow to aquifer, and if you calculate the change in groundwater storage based on the measured groundwater level data, 
there will be a mass balance error sometime, which you need to address and explain what is the source of that is. So that is kind of the general framework of the change in groundwater storage. Next slide, please. In here, I want to highlight the importance of understanding change in groundwater storage, which is not the same as groundwater overdraft as highlighted on the page on the right. And bulletin 118 defines overdraft as the condition of a groundwater basin in which the amount of water withdrawn by pumping exceeds the amount of water that recharges the basin over a period of years during which water supply conditions approximate average conditions. Given the definition, we want to highlight three differences between the change in groundwater storage and the groundwater overdraft. Change in groundwater is an annual construct, whereas overdraft is calculated over a period of representative years. Change in storage accounts for all inflow outflow components, whereas overdraft only includes groundwater pumping and recharge from different sources. And the change in storage can be an accretion or depletion of the system, whereas overdraft always indicates a depletion of the system. So I think it's important to understand the difference between change in storage and the groundwater overdraft. Next slide, please. In the handbook, we talk about four methods. And again, our standard approach is method one, which is obtain available technical reports and studies because there are many studies that have been done in different basins about changing groundwater storage for different you know, uh, purposes. And so we always recommend that you look at the available technical reports and studies to get a sense of who ha has done the estimates before. Next slide, please. So method two is a little bit more detailed step of the same approach that obtain available spreadsheets and numerical models. There are many numerical models, especially in California, that have been developed by local, regional, and statewide entities. And you should look at those numerical models to see are there available estimates of change in groundwater storage. For example, you know, USGS has multiple models, uh, DWR has CTBC in the Central Valley, and the IWFM applied in many other places. So if you go to the next slide, it shows again some of the data sources. If you look at the right hand side of the figure, like you look at the change in groundwater storage column, and then you can find out we have identified three sources of changing groundwater storage at the bottom, which are basically some numerical models, you know, the CBHM and the CTV SIM coarse grid and fine grid model has changed in groundwater storage estimate for different uh, sub basins or regions that you could define. Next slide, please. Method three is a, also a very popular method of calculating change in storage using measured data and aquifer properties. So you can estimate, you know, you can take the groundwater level data and use the aquifer parameters. And groundwater level data is available in from the CASGEM program, Department of Water Data Library, you know, USGS has groundwater level data and local monitoring efforts also have groundwater data data. So you question the left hand side, you can see of this slide, change in groundwater storage is calculated as groundwater elevation at time zero minus groundwater elevation of time one. Basically looking at a one year time period, you can look at the changes in groundwater elevation between the in a start and ending time period multiply by the overlaying area and the specific yield to get a change in groundwater storage. And example of using this method three is can be found in section six, you know, page 226, where we have used this groundwater contour, you know, information available to us to estimate the, you know, change in groundwater storage for that method in section six, where we develop water budget without a model. So that's where you can find a good example there. Next slide, please. Method four, again, is they are using a mass balance approach. Like for example, you can say change in groundwater storage equal to inflow to aquifer and outflow from aquifer. If you can calculate all the inflow to the aquifer and also find out all the outflow to aquifer by using different methods of calculation, you can estimate change in groundwater storage in that method, you know. 
So that's the method four. Uh, I, next slide, please. So do you have any questions on the change in groundwater storage? Thank you, Sakim. We do have a question. Can you clarify whether the calculation of overdraft should be should include consideration of interbasin inflows, outflows, particular, particularly in the context of sigma? That's I think um, um, is a kind of technical plus policy question. I think uh, overdraft definition is, is looking at your basin and look at over a 10 year or you know some other time period that you look at your net uh, recharge versus net depletion. You can calculate the overdraft. And if the interbasin flow is a component of that, uh, that's something you need to consider, but I think I would defer to those kind of uh, some policy definition uh, to uh, DWR. Tyler, um, Tyler, could you speak to that, please? Yeah, I can, I can speak a little bit to that. So uh, in terms of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, the water budget requirements are laid out in uh, the GSP regulations. So that uh, specifically is uh, Title 23 of the California Code of Regulations and then Section 354.18. And so in there, it uh, mentions the components that are required as part of a water budget for a GSP. And so one of those things is the total surface water entering and leaving the basin and the inflow to the groundwater system and outflows from the groundwater system. So in the case where you have interbasin flows that are an outflow from your uh, water budget, then yes, you, will, you would need to calculate those. Uh, one certainly case that can occur is that those can be affected by a neighboring basin. And uh, so that is something that will affect the overall balance or budget that you have for uh, your basin. So uh, that will need to be included um, in that overall calculation. Thank you, Tyler and Sakib. We have another question. What are the main factors that drive groundwater storage change? Obviously, it's an infant outflow. Pumping is a major driver for groundwater change in storage. And then, as we just discussed, you know, some other activities, depending on your water budget zone, activities outside of your uh, groundwater zone could affect, then the recharge is a major inflow, like depletion, uh, the, uh, what you call is the depercolation is a major source of inflow to the groundwater basin from the agriculture return flow. So that is also a major uh, component of the change in groundwater storage. Thank you. Does a groundwater outflow to an adjacent basin become an undesirable result that needs to be monitored and maintained? I would also defer to Tyler on that one because uh, undesirable results is a sustainability indicators under Sigma. So uh, an outflow to an adjacent basin is not defined as an undesirable result under Sigma. Sigma has the six undesirable results. Overdraft is one of those things. Uh, and so uh, obviously the, the water budget is important in uh, calculating groundwater storage as it pertains to the overdraft of the basin. 
However, um, looking at it from that perspective, I mean, you're going to have to weigh in those factors, and that's a local uh, defined decision is in terms of exactly how undesirable results occur, but the department does have a role in determining one basin's impact on another sustainability. So in such a case where one basin was causing the overdraft in another basin, there would potentially be a mechanism for the department to review that information and uh, make an, a, an assessment of whether or not that uh, particular case was occurring so that we could decide uh, whether that was out of the one local agency's control and the adjacent basin was responsible for that. Thank you, Tyler and Saki. We have another question. Can remote sensing be used for estimating change in groundwater in storage? It could be. There have been some studies done in different parts of using remote sensing to estimate change in groundwater storage, uh, but uh, there are some scaling issue. Uh, what is the scale? Like, for example, uh, GRACE uh, is a program from NASA, I believe, and I think DWR is working with uh, a team on some of the GRACE data implementation. Uh, Paul or Abdul, you want to add something to ongoing work for some GRACE data? Yeah, I can add, and Paul, you can also chime in. So uh, DWR, uh, as I understand it, we are not currently working with uh, NASA on the GRACE data, but we did uh, previously work with uh, NASA JPL and NASA Ames in terms of seeing whether satellite data from GRACE, how it can be utilized and how does it compare with uh, data from uh, change in groundwater storage estimated by C2V SIM and change in groundwater storage estimated by uh, using uh, uh, observed groundwater levels. So based on that study, we found that uh, the results were similar. However, uh, at the time, uh, the GRACE was the first generation GRACE, and the spatial scale was very large. Uh, it could estimate uh, this uh, change in uh, storage value for uh, sort of like a, their resolution was 20,000 square miles, like sort of entire central valley. So that issue was there. And the other issue, uh, other thing to consider is uh, the information which is provided by GRACE is uh, sort of like a change in total storage. And then you still have to somehow quantify the change in surface water storage, change in uh, storage from in snowpack, and change in storage in soil moisture. Then you subtract those values from the change in total storage from GRACE uh, to obtain the change in groundwater storage. And my understanding is uh, that uh, subsequent to this first generation GRACE, uh, there is now a second generation GRACE called GRACE follow-on. And uh, um, our understanding is uh, the there is a sort of improved resolution in terms of uh, the area it covers. Uh, but at the same time, I think uh, the important thing is uh, the satellite, at least uh, for the even the current generation, great follow-on, uh, sort of will need to be used in conjunction with other uh, sources of information, whether it's an integrated groundwater surface water model and uh, measured groundwater level data uh, to see how uh, the GRACE information can actually evolve in the future uh, to be much more applicable for smaller areas. Paul, you want to add anything? Yeah, I was just going to add that um, if you're interested in GRACE, I highly recommend you check it out uh, on their website. And if you don't know where that is, there's a page in the handbook on GRACE, which is section 9.33, 
and page 376. It'll provide you a link to where you can learn more about GRACE and as well as a brief description of the GRACE program. Thank you, Abdul and Paul. Any other question, uh, Francisco? I did not see any more questions. Um, we could move forward. Tyler? Yeah, thank you, Abdul. Uh, so my name is Tyler Hatch. I'm the lead of the new uh, models and tools support section within the Sustainable Groundwater Management Office here at DWR. And uh, I'm also the project manager and one of the de developers of the C2V SIM fine grid, the department's integrated hydrologic model application for the Central Valley. So as we've talked about earlier, uh, calculating a water budget is a requirement under uh, the groundwater sustainability plan regulations and uh, under SIGMA. So uh, as I mentioned previously, those are found under that section 354.18 and uh, that defines the specific regulatory requirements for a water budget and the types of water budgets, including like a historical water budget, a current water budget and a projected water budget and all the different pieces that are expected as part of a groundwater sustainability plan water budget. Obviously, water budgets are a very important tool and can be really important for management of water resources, both surface water and groundwater. Uh, the complexity of a water budget will largely be dependent on location. So it uh, depends on exactly what you're looking at and the detail to which you need it to be, uh, depending on the complexity of the situation. So if you have a lot of different sources of, of water, a lot of different uh, infrastructure and other ways of moving water around, and you have a lot of different aquifers which you pull water from, the potential for your water budget to be much more complicated uh, is there, whereas in other cases it may be very simple or uh, much simpler anyway. Uh, the Water Budget Handbook provides a framework including a set of definitions and data sources that can be used to develop a water budget in a systematic way. And this approach can be used for groundwater sustainability planning and developing your water budget for the, the GSP. Uh, one of the reasons is why we actually posted the water budget handbook draft on our uh, data and tools page is because of that anticipated linkage between folks looking for guidance on how to develop a water budget and then Sigma. The use of the water budget handbook, though, doesn't guarantee that the, the water budget will meet the regulatory requirements of the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Uh, so for the specific regulatory requirements, refer back to that uh, regulatory uh, section that I referred to, 354.18. And uh, we also have the water budget BMP that uh, provides a little bit more detail and context on the regulatory requirements. For questions, and obviously I've been trying to chime in and answer some of the questions that have come up related to uh, Sigma-related water budget questions uh, earlier in the talk, but uh, for further questions, feel free to reach out to me or reach out to the department through our region office points of contact. Uh, we are interested through our technical assistance role at the Sustainable Groundwater Management Office in providing the best possible technical assistance we can. So we invite any comments and feedback on the Water Budget Handbook, as well as any of the other data tools and guidance that we provide. One last thing I'll note is that uh, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Office is in the process of expanding our 
groundwater modeling and water budget team in an effort to provide more timely technical assistance to the public. And uh, with that, uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, Francisco, any questions for Tyler? Not yet. Okay, let's uh, give folks a minute or two before moving on. You have a question? Where do we find the water budget BMP? Also, what sections of Title 23 address AB 1668 water budget requirements? So the water budget BMP can be found through our uh, Sigma webpage. And I believe we have a specific BMP's uh, page. It's so my internet's going slow, so I'll uh, try to provide a specific linkage to that. But you should be able to look for best management practices through our uh, Sigma webpage, and it should take you there pretty directly. As far as the AB 1668 requirements, uh, that won't, I don't know the uh, if there's direct regulations on that uh, for, certainly it's not under the same regulations as the groundwater sustainability plan regulations, um, but perhaps somebody else knows more about what those requirements are for water budgets. Tyler, for reference, I've just um, moved the screen over to show the best metric practices and guidance documents page right. on the Sigma website. And you can see water budget is number four, the BMPs right here. It's available here. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. So we have another question. Up. Yeah, go ahead. Great. Can you provide a brief update on the status of C2V SIM? and whether the simulation period will be extended? Yes, I, I can provide a, an update on CTV SIM. So we're in the process of wrapping up the calibration uh, efforts for the version one release, which is gonna, is still planned for the end of spring this year. And at that time we'll have the, uh, documentation and everything else associated with what we've done to date. This won't inc include an extension of time past 2015. However, that's going to be one of our first uh, tasks once we release a version one model to extend the model period. And so we're taking steps currently to acquire uh, some of the additional data that's necessary to expand the the temporal period of the model through uh, 2019. And then we'll be making subsequent updates for the period. Uh, so stay tuned for, for more. I don't have a specific date on when that extended version would be available, but that is our next step after uh, version one is complete. Hey, hey Francisco, I just want to go. Francisco, yes, I just I want to go back to Assembly Bill 1668, and uh, I do not have the specific, uh, we can check and provide that information, but I was just looking at uh, Water Budget Handbook uh, Section 1, and actually we include sort of a quote from Assembly Bill 1668. Uh, so this was passed in uh, 2018, at it, and it requires agricultural water management plans to include an annual water budget based on the quantification of all inflow and outflow components for the service area of the agricultural water supplier. 
but if you want uh, any additional and specific and more detailed information, I would welcome, I would uh, basically recommend uh, that you contact um, DWR's Water Use and Efficiency Branch, who are actually uh, sort of uh, leading uh, the effort in terms of implementation of Assembly Bill 1668. And in line with uh, also what Tyler just said, uh, in terms of uh, two things, one is obviously the update on CTVs and fine grade, and the other thing he mentioned previously that uh, water budget can be uh, looked at depending on the you know particular situation as a more simple thing, and then in certain circumstances much more complicated. And actually, when uh, we uh, started uh, developing the water budget handbook. This was of a uh, very uh, critical consideration to capture this notion in the handbook that uh, water budget for uh, agencies will be an evolving process from simple to higher level of complexity. And uh, so a starting point could be looking at what are the really big drivers in terms of the inflows and outflows? And then could uh, that entity come up with some estimates of these uh, big inflow and outflow quantities and use the construct in the water budget handbook, the uh, whether the 3D schematic and its operational framework of the water budget accounting template and over time, uh, gradually, you know, fill those templates and develop a better understanding. And then uh, the expectation is, is uh, as this evolution takes place, over time, these agencies, again, depending on, you know, the particular in your situation, may evolve to a point where they may be inclined to develop uh, more sophisticated tool like the uh, an integrated groundwater surface water model like uh, DWR's uh, based on DWR's integrated water uh, flow model framework and or uh, USGSS mod flow ohm you know framework and one of the things and we did not mention in uh, specifically in today's uh, webinar uh, as uh, when we were conducting the Tular Lake hydrologic region pilot, uh, we used the uh, DWR's tool CPV SIM to as a foundational, you know, uh, sort of data and information source. And even with that, uh, we encountered uh, this issue of how do you then uh, translate uh, model inputs and outputs so that you can actually understand the water budget in a uh, uh, more uh, transparent and uh, significant way. So uh, in water budget handbook, because of that uh, difficulty in the water budget handbook, uh, we have section seven, which essentially sort of we are presenting as, as a case study, but it is more like if you had a calibrated model based on IWFM, and then how do you then use the output from that model and the results from that model to come up with a, a total water budget based on the 3D construct and the water budget accounting template? So that's section seven in the handbook. And similarly, uh, for section eight, uh, it is essentially uh, lays down the same uh, sort of process and steps. How do you uh, come up with a total water budget based on uh, mod flow ohm uh, results? I just wanted to mention that even if an entity, a water agency, uh, has a fully calibrated, well accepted model, uh, currently the way uh, these models are structured they do not lend themselves uh, readily to be able to come up with the total water budget.
Thank you, Abdul. Those are all the questions. Uh, we could move on to the next section. Yes, please. Uh, can you go to the next slide, Paul? So he, I'd like to remind uh, all our uh, you know participants today uh, that uh, please provide your feedback on the Water Budget Handbook, uh, which closes on May 7. And uh, the other thing I want to mention is, uh, and I, I don't know, uh, Francis is probably going to sort of start a poll. Uh, we'd really like to know uh, that if you'd like uh, webinars such as today's to cover additional water budget components in more detail, and then uh, if you do uh, request you know, such webinars uh, based on your requests, uh, we'll try to respond to your needs uh, in the future. So Francisco, you're going to try to do the polling, okay? Yeah, here is the poll, please respond. And I think Paul, uh, Francisco will have a follow-up poll in terms of uh, your interest in future webinars. So there is a third poll now. Thank you for those about it. So Francisco, are you planning to show the results from the poll? Okay, so this is the second poll. Oh, nice, very good, very good. So I just want to mention uh, before we close the webinar, uh, but we'll have a follow-up 30-minute session just in case there are additional questions. Uh, the main thing is uh, uh, I'd like to state that as we continue uh, to get your feedback on the handbook, and as we uh, develop additional understanding of your needs, uh, we'll definitely uh, try to enhance that handbook based on your input. And in particular, and this is a big thing for us, uh, we'll try to further strengthen uh, discussion related to specific water budget components as we are learning you know, more about you know, the issues which uh, may, we may not have covered fully or issues uh, to specific water budget components, which where we need to put a little bit more focus and provide additional clarity. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll close the webinar and thank you everyone, but please stand by. Uh, we'll open up uh, optional uh, 30 minutes q and A session uh, to respond to any additional questions uh, that you may have. Thank you. We do have a question for Todd that we did not get to uh, in the last section. How do you do a water budget for the groundwater extracted from under the for coral clay layer? 
how do you consider that groundwater is recharged? Okay, do I, maybe the question would be, I'm kind of hearing maybe two, two questions or two thoughts is, you know, how do we, how do we, how do we know groundwater from that, that layer or how much, and do we know if that water is recharged to, to that, to that layer, and maybe I'll, I'll, go into um, where if we had let's let's say some GIS data and we knew something about wells and where they were pumping from you would be able to uh, maybe query the data query the land use and estimate what you thought was being drawn from those levels based on well data uh, would help to inform if how much you would be pumping from let's say the core below the cork corcoran layer that would be one one way to consider consider that uh, using the handbook the methods in the handbook now recharge if I'm understanding the maybe the question correctly, is you know what do we consider recharge and does it does it get down to that layer? I'm I'm not necessarily an expert on the 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 movement of water to that layer, and maybe that's where one of our other technical experts can help. One of the things though you can do is again looking at the irrigation efficiencies and kind of knowing your soils you can make at least initial estimates of what you think is recharging um, meaning moving downward uh, maybe not to the through the restrictive layer like you said I'll maybe ask some input from Saqib or, or Tyler Abdul on this uh, but you can make an estimate or at least re recharge from that applied water or groundwater extraction. Saqib, Abdul, or Tyler, any thoughts? I I just I mean, I'll start, but then let uh, Saqib and uh, Tyler chime in. Uh, so one of the things uh, in in the water budget handbook. Uh, is uh, this, as I mentioned, the evolution of computation of water budgets. Then you have uh, sort of going beyond the volumetric issue. You're looking at the actual movement of water and actual disposition of water. In many of these cases, uh, it may be required that uh, over time, uh, uh, an integrated groundwater surface water model be developed, which can allow you to sort of trace the movement of water, whether in terms of the recharge uh, or the actual extraction. So uh, in many uh, complex situations and in situation, there may be necessary that a water agency or an, a water practitioner is actually uh, start thinking about, based on understanding of the basic data set, how that basic data set then can be used to start uh, the towards the process of developing an integrated groundwater surface water model, whether it be based on some sort of IWFM construct or modflow construct. Sakib and Tyler, uh, would you like to chime in? Sure, I'll add to that that groundwater flow and movement, especially as you're going through a confining layer as significant as the corker and clay is going to be quite slow. And it's going to depend on the head in the shallow aquifer above the corker and clay versus 
what the uh, head is in the uh, deeper aquifer beneath the Corcoran clay to induce some sort of movement across that layer. And so recharge is going to uh, depend on that. If, it, if there is any that would occur through that at all, uh, of course, at, at that point, you may not even call it recharge because, in fact, it's already groundwater that's moved potentially several hundred feet downward from the surface to even come into contact with the Corcoran clay. Now, the deeper aquifer does get recharge uh, that eventually makes its way beneath the Corcoran clay, and that, that could occur from like mountain front recharge on the eastern side or potentially on the western side where the clay is not present. And so you can uh, get some flow, but that takes a long, long time to get there. So in terms of an annual water budget, um, you may not see that directly. It, it's going to take well, quite a bit of time to get there. And that's where something like a integrated hydrologic model or even just a groundwater model would be able to provide you a little bit more about the, the movement and flow dynamics of the, the water as it makes its way there. Saki, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, Francisco, let's move on. Please comment uh, on what is the best approach in developing water budget and and in developing a water budget analytically and numerical modeling regarding which comes first for an an integrated groundwater and surface water system. So if I understood the question correctly is uh, it's talking about uh, which approach uh, is better in terms of developing water budget. And I'll just reiterate, and actually we at one time we had some uh, schematic to actually uh, sort of demonstrate uh, in terms of the evolution of water budget component from a very minimal to a very robust water budget and uh, some of the criteria uh, criteria we suggested was uh, availability of data availability of uh, resources then also availability of uh, technical capacity of an agency uh, so based on uh, those three basic criteria uh, what we suggest, I mean, we have that suggestion still in the handbook, except we don't have that schematic, is, uh, is uh, depending uh, on your, you know, progress in uh, these three criteria, uh, an agency, a water agency may consider uh, starting with understanding of the data and see whether uh, some initial uh, water budgets can be developed based on existing data, then uh, identify data gaps, and then uh, procure or secure resources, and then simultaneously uh, sort of uh, have a program to develop technical capacity in the agency, then go to the next level. And the next level, uh, we suggest that uh, rather than going into a full-fledged uh, integrated groundwater and surface water model, consider using uh, uh, sort of uh, more uh, advanced uh, sort of uh, sort of uh, equations to compute or estimate some of the water budget components. So that would be the sort of like in this evolution, the second stage. Then as that agency continue to, you know, procure resources and develop technical capacity and have better data and understanding of those data, then use this knowledge base over time and the capacity building over time to uh, start the process of developing 
an integrated uh, groundwater and surface water model. So this is resource intensive. And, uh, and then the other issue with an uh, integrated groundwater surface water model, as uh, we have experienced in uh, DWR and based on our knowledge, uh, USGS has experienced the same thing and other you know, local agencies uh, to have a fully calibrated uh, which is also uh, widely accepted by the stakeholders. Uh, it's 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 time consuming. It's resource intensive, and it can only be done over time. So uh, this the final stages, and hopefully there will be a time in California. Uh, uh, there will be every groundwater basin or every groundwater basin and a watershed. Uh, in California over time has this, uh, whether it be mod flow or ohm or integrated water flow model, we have this, you know, the entire state is covered by that model and we have the data sets to, you know, calibrate these models and we have much better understanding of how and fundamentally the water budget is about understanding uh, water movement. Where is all the water coming from and where they are going in terms of this interaction from the atmosphere to the land system to the surface water system and groundwater system. And uh, this evolution, at least within DWR, our hope is that this evolution will take place, if not today, if not in the next five years, but because of Sigma, AB 68, and because of, you know, governor's water resilience portfolio, uh, we are very, very hopeful that uh, in future, uh, California will reach a stage where we have this uh, robust integrated groundwater surface water model for the entire state. Tyler, uh, Todd, if you would like to add anything. Sure, I'll, I'll say in terms of referencing back to the, the question of whether you start from like a water budget or whether you go straight into a model, uh, I think it depends on the question really that you're trying to answer. And uh, I mean, I'm a proponent of using the simplest tool that's adequate for the job. And oftentimes, data is a limiting factor in that uh, but depending on how detailed or exactly what you're you're looking for if like we were talking about earlier if you're interested in the the time component and tracing how water moves through the system and what the response looks like and things like that then you're going to probably be pointed towards developing a model uh, now if you're just looking at trying to develop an idea of the ins and outs from your basin and uh, something more like a, an accounting tool, like a, the accounting template or just a simple water budget is suitable for answering those questions and estimating some of those components, then uh, that should be pursued. You don't need to spend any more uh, money developing a tool that doesn't give you a a better answer. Todd, would you like to add Todd and Paul? Yeah, I'll I'll add a little bit to that and I agree with Tyler. I think the you need to develop an approach that suits what you need in the most simplistic way. And even if I was developing a model some of the things that I might consider is hmm, some of the techniques in the handbook. I might do some back of the envelope calculations, so to say, something to help frame the picture in what I'm trying to develop for the model so I have an idea of where, where maybe I'm going and the magnitude of some of the components. So kind of a combination can help, can help inform what you're doing and give you a starting place of 
what to think for your conceptual model and what you want to address as inputs. A few of the inputs in terms of water demand or applied water and other things can be rough cut. Sometimes they're even, you could pre-process and enter urban information in through that using the handbook techniques and put them into a model. So there's a variety of interactions between do, both processes. I would use the most simplistic first to get a get a, get yourself a picture of um, what you're what you're an, analyzing before you know you dive deep into deep into a model. And Paul, just, Paul, you, like that. Yeah, go yeah ahead. to add that we actually do have a discussion of this in the handbook. Touch on section 2-2, .2, page 18, and goes to the next few pages, discusses the modeling approach and non-modeling approach and what are some of the pros and cons of each, and actually includes a decision tree that starts with the initial assessment, like Tyler said, of what is it you need a water budget for? What time scales do you need it for? What components are you trying to estimate? Those are really important factors in determining what kind of water budget or model you might need to develop. But that information is in the handbook I said sections 2.2 .2 and 2.3, starting on page 18, um, and might be helpful if you have that kind of question. And actually, I'll go a little bit, Paul. You want to run through these uh, decision columns? I think those are very important in terms of responding to the questions, because uh, uh, it's almost like uh, if you run through this question, why don't you do that? I think that will be useful. Did you want me to actually pull up the um, handbook itself here? Oh, I, I have that, so I can I can then run through it. I have that, okay. So uh, the question is, after the initial assessment, uh, the question is, do you need a model to develop missing components of water budget? If the answer is no, then the recommendation is use a non-modeling approach, meaning use available data to compute those components. If the answer is yes, then the next question is, is there an integrated model that covers your area, or could you develop an integrated model that covers your area? Again, if the question is no, then the recommendation is use the non-modeling approach. So the question, is, if the answer is yes, then you go, is the model calibrated and accepted by stakeholders? And this runs through several processes, so I'm going to just Go to the end now. So, uh, uh, so the basic idea is, if you do not have a model calibrated and accepted by stakeholders, which can be used for your area of concern, you probably should still, uh, at least for the time being, focus on the non-modeling approach. However, if there is a model which is calibrated and uh, accepted by the stakeholders and can be used in your area, then choose a modeling approach. So similar you know, decision phase in terms of uh, actually uh, developing uh, sort of a process of looking at the data sets and sort of, uh, and this is applicable for both the non-modeling and modeling approaches. Uh, in terms of how do you then go about systematically uh, procure or compile the data sets uh, for sort of starting on the path of developing a water budget. Actually, I'm looking at, uh, this is uh, figure 2-5, flowchart for compiling data for non-modeling approach. Although here we say non-modeling approach, Actually, this is equally applicable in uh, for the modeling approach. And uh, the process we delineate is, uh, is starting with uh, developing a hydro hydrogeologic conceptual model, looking at past studies, doing a data checklist in terms of water budget components, and then sort of compiling uh, data sets for land use, precipitation, and soil and then steam flow and diversion, groundwater pumping, managed recharge, 
and then uh, groundwater elevation. So this is actually, uh, let me see that whether you can find the page number. I don't, see, yeah, page number actually 40, and uh, the figure is uh, 2-5. Thank you. I've got that on the screen. Hopefully you can see that. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. We have another question. Could you restate the distinction between change in one water storage and overdraft? Is it only related to the time period evaluated? No, actually, uh, if you recall, uh, Paul is trying to get uh, that part. Okay, so if you recall, essentially there are three differences. One is obviously the time period. Uh, the way change in groundwater storage is defined in the handbook is an annual sort of estimate where overdraft based on the definition as it is now in bulletin 118 and uh, that definition has not changed. It is uh, calculated a period of representative years uh, during which water can supply conditions approximate average conditions. The second distance is change in storage accounts for all inflow and outflow components. And as Tyler mentioned, uh, in terms of the uh, Sigma Act and then also GSP regulations, the directive is to look at all inflow and outflow components. But overdraft is looking at groundwater pumping and recharge. And then uh, change in storage, and this is a big difference since it's an annual construct, as we all know that annually, the change in storage can be either uh, sort of an increase in storage or a decrease in storage. Where, at a, whereas overdraft is uh, by definition uh, is a depletion in the system because it says the amount of water withdrawn by pumping exceeds the amount of water that recharges the basin. So there are essentially, based on our uh, set of review and analysis, there are three differences. Uh, uh, not only the you know annual versus a period of representative years. Thank you. We have another question. It was mentioned that more surface monitoring stations are needed. The ZWR or any other agency going to define where those monitoring stations will go and assure that the data is posted online in real time and is consistent and is a consistently reliable flow data? Uh, I'll, I'll respond to the first one. Uh, I think uh, and I don't recall Paul and Todd or Tyler, if you remember the exact uh, the assembly or I think it's a Senate bill and which directs uh, DWR and uh, State Water Resources Control Board to actually make an assessment in terms of uh, the uh, stream gauging uh, uh, requirements in the state of California. And then uh, this one is actually further reiterated uh, as a particular action. Again, I cannot uh, uh, recall the specific action in governor's uh, water resilience portfolio, uh, reiterates uh, this actually task for uh, DWR and uh, State Water Resources Control Board. So the expectation is uh, once this assessment is completed, then uh, there will be sort of maybe additional legislative directives and or executive directive in terms of how uh, these uh, uh, stream gauging stations can be put in place so that we can uh, sort of collect the necessary stream flow data. 
And in terms of maybe making this data available, as you may know, and I would ask Paul to sort of chime in, uh, as you know, as part of the AB1755 implementation, uh, the open uh, and transparent water data platform, the DWR has been working with uh, sister water agencies in terms of making uh, both uh, state uh, data and federal data sets available uh, through this open water data platform. And uh, if uh, additional stream flow data, which uh, can significantly extend uh, that uh, source of information, uh, I believe uh, that data sets will also be uh, sort of uh, like our stakeholders will be able to access those data sets to the uh, open water data platform. Paul, do you want to add hey, anything or Todd or Tyler? Yeah, yeah I ahead. wanted to add so the Senate bill in question, by the way, Senate Bill 19 by Dodd from um, 2019. Um, and there have been discussions on that. I'm not part of the discussions, but I do know that there is um, the, the information that is generated from any additional stream pages will for sure be shared via DWR's open data, oh, not DWR's, but through to California's open data platform, um, which would likely be through the CNRA open data portal or the CA um, open data platform. Todd or Tyler, would you like to add anything? Yeah, this is Tyler. Uh, there are some efforts going on that uh, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Office is involved with for uh, looking at some of the stream gauges and needs associated with that. And um, I believe there's a few stations that have been identified that we'll be planning. I don't know which ones those are off the top of my head, but uh, I could provide, probably look into and get some more information on that. Uh, and I believe uh, any data that would be collected through a new stream gauge would be at least posted through uh, the CDEC uh, area, so that's the California Data Exchange Center, and they have all the a lot of the other stream gauge information available through our flood management group at DWR, and then I'm sure that would also be replicated on the open data platform as well. Todd, do you have anything you want to add? No, I don't. I don't have anything to add. Any more questions, Francisco? Yes. Is actual ET by remote sensing acceptable in the context of Sigma? Does EWR have plans to provide remote sensing data ET data statewide? The, uh, I learned, uh, yeah, actually. Uh, so we have uh, actually acquired, uh, I think, eight years of statewide remotely sensed ET actual data. Uh, and that data, uh, we're still trying to figure out since it's a lot of information how to post it, but we can uh, make it available by request. Uh, but in terms of using ET Actual for Sigma purposes, I, I guess I'm, I'm not necessarily clear exactly how it plans to be used. Mainly if it's just a component in the water budget, then that seems to be fine. But uh, there are many different ways that you could use ET Actual in terms of uh, management, and so that'll depend on the situation. Uh, but in terms of the water budget specifically, using ET Actual, uh, there shouldn't be a problem with that for historical purposes or even current purposes. I do want to, if you don't mind, remind people that ET Actual is still um, a developing field, and it, it, it has been improving through, through time, but there's still a lot of uncertainty. Um, with existing techniques that we hope will get better as we um, 
I use these uh, th this data source. Correct. Yeah, there's uncertainty with anything uh, remotely sensed, and uh, usually, obviously, field verification and comparison is, is warranted. Uh, remotely sensed data, of course, has uh, the challenge that uh, oftentimes for calculating ET, you can't see through clouds very well. So uh, there are some cloud screening methods, and those are developing in terms of how we, we account for that in the, the ET calculation as well. So yeah, there's a lot of different things that play into it. Uh, and obviously, knowing the land use associated with where that ET is occurring is, is also helpful. And if you're interested in knowing more about ET sources that are available, I highly recommend checking out NASA's Open ET program. Uh, it's very cool and hopefully will help in this area. So Francisco, uh, we are sort of now towards the end of our optional 30 minute session. So what I suggest is we uh, sort of uh, record all additional questions and we'll find a way to respond to them. And in the meantime, I, I'd like, uh, really like to thank all the panelists, uh, Sakib, Todd, Paul, Tyler, and then uh, uh, Francisco for uh, managing the webinar and uh, Diane for sort of uh, helping us with the uh, live captioning. And uh, so we'll be signing off now. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, everyone very much uh, for participating in this webinar and staying for that extra half an hour. And uh, depending on your uh, responses, uh, if we can uh, sort of design additional webinars in the future, uh, we'll provide that information through various, uh, you know, avenues, including uh, water plan, e-news, and uh, Sigma news. And uh, so, finally, uh, I hope all of us, uh, all of us, and all of you, uh, stay safe and healthy, and continue to be productive uh, in this uh, new uh, sort of world uh, resulting from COVID-19 situation.